Peru boasts one of the driest deserts in the world. Stretched out in a narrow strip, the whole length of its 1,500 mile long coast. It's a place of stark inhospitable beauty. A barren land which contrasts sharply with the richness of the ocean waters pounding its shore. Here the frigid nutrient-rich Humboldt current flowing up from Antarctica meets the warm waters of the tropics. The result is an explosion of plankton and a flowering of marine life. For 35 years, Doswinkel has been driven by a passion to photograph wildlife and local cultures. On this assignment, he's looking to capture the hidden beauty of Peru's fragile, threatened desert coast. The starting point for this journey of dramatic contrasts is one of the most remote and unspoilt coastal regions in the country, the enigmatic Biovar Peninsula. It's a fragile paradise, where life has found ways to survive on less than half a cup of water a year. But remote as it is, this paradise is coming increasingly under pressure from human development, both planned and unplanned, spreading along the coast. Chiclayo is a dusty, wind-blown town on Peru's north coast. It's a major commercial center and the base for a busy fishing fleet. For Dos, it signifies the end of the tarmac. After a very long drive up from Lima, we've now left the road and we're on the beach. And we have to stay on the beach because this is the only way to reach the area that we want to visit. There are no other roads. Doss's companion and guide is biologist Stefan Austermüller. As director of the conservation group Mondo Azul, He's campaigning for better protection of Peru's marine and coastal ecosystems. Stefan Austermüller is especially concerned about this area because there is a lot of illegal dolphin slaughter and also turtle slaughter. So we have to scan the beach for dead animals and have to examine them and see what happened to them. This looks like a dolphin. What's this? Well, this is a porpoise. The low front and the typical fin of a porpoise. In the 90s, we had some 10 to 15,000 dolphins slaughtered on the beaches here. That's incredible. So that's a lot. At first, I thought that these animals really died of a natural cause because you couldn't see anything. The most likely cause is that they have been strangled or died in the nets of the, of the fishermen here. These animals have to come to the surface to breathe. They're mammals. It's a sad story, huh? The killing of dolphins and other small whales and the sale of their meat has been illegal in Peru since 1990. But that doesn't stop around 50 of them being killed each day. While public campaigns against this slaughter have meant that dolphin meat is no longer openly sold in supermarkets, these beautiful creatures continue to die, often through drowning after getting tangled in fishing nets. Our driver is not so happy with the fact that we want to stop because it's difficult in the wet and soft sand to restart after stopping. The only sign of human settlement is there's a very small fishing village, but for me it's really disgusting. There are hundreds and hundreds of 
decapitated stingrays on the beach and they leave everything on the beach, these people. Such beautiful animals and they use such a small part of it. Stefan wants to see if there are any signs of dolphins and or turtles, but we don't see any. What we do see is that the nets they're fishing with are way too fine. They're catching all the juvenile fish and this is probably why the fish population is decreasing so rapidly here. The job of stopping to record and photograph each dolphin and turtle found on the beach is slowing down progress. With only an hour or so to go before high tide and the light already beginning to fail, a sense of urgency takes hold. I expected extremely dry, hot weather and what we have here is fog cold winds and we had even some rain and the weather hasn't changed and you know me as a simple bonarian i'm freezing to death really <laughs> i'm so cold <laughs> <laughs> i have to say that for me this was a very strange day i've never ever seen so many dead animals and so many different species so many different types of dolphins and and uh, different species of turtles and all these bones and vertebrae it's really incredible Now we just got up, it's still very very early, it's cold, it's windy. When you look at this desert landscape, it looks empty. But when you take a closer look, it's full of life. There are flowers, there are insects, there are bigger animals. In fact, it's a very fragile world. The balance is very delicate. The slightest disturbance can be disastrous. The desert fox used to be common all along the coast. But today, for the timid fox and a whole range of desert plants beautifully adapted to these harsh conditions, Biovar offers a final refuge. Together with other local and national conservation groups, Stefan's main goal is to turn this rugged place into a national park. As part of a detailed submission to the central government, he's carrying on an ongoing survey of each major ecological zone. The strip of beach covered and uncovered twice a day by the tide is one of the richest habitats in Biowa. Here the rock crab and its many cousins jostles for attention with other intertidal dwellers like these gooseneck barnacles. What a magnificent place. There are lots and lots of sea lions. This is the South American sea lion and there are only males. All the females and the cubs are on offshore islands. They only come to the coast when it's breeding season. The longer I'm here, the more I appreciate this wonderful area and the better I understand that Stefan wants to protect this area 
uh, for the future and also for future generations. That evening, Doss is surprised to find that the gooseneck barnacles he'd been photographing earlier are on the dinner menu. What, for most people, is just a nuisance to be scraped off the bottom of boats is regarded here as a great delicacy. Be that as it may, Doss has no intention of breaking his vegetarian habit to find out why. To better understand the range of problems facing Peru's long coast, Stefan invites Doss to join him on a survey he's making 800 miles down south, in Peru's only marine park, which in contrast to pristine Biovar, has lived with the impact of humans for centuries. Peru keeps amazing me. The journey to this place was full of contrast and it threw up some surreal moments. The town of Ica is famous for its huge sand dunes and surprisingly, believe it or not, a wine that has been produced here since Spanish times. But for me, the most impressive is this raw desert landscape. I love it. It's hard to believe that the ocean is just an hour's drive away. team is heading for the Ballestas Islands, 150 miles south of Lima, in the National Marine Reserve of Paracas. Seabirds, and more particularly their waste droppings, called guano, have shaped the history of this place for hundreds of years. Since pre-Inca times, people have come out to these islands to collect guano and use it as a natural fertilizer. Over the course of thousands of years, these birds have built up deposits to depths of 150 feet. By the late 19th century, a major trade in this white gold had been established with Europe and North America, making it one of the most highly prized natural resources in the world and bringing huge wealth to the country. But when a way was found to produce nitrogen fertilizers artificially, the trade in guano collapsed and the people here were left with only one source of income, fishing. This is a guano island and we're going to dive today in a guano ship which is here on the seafloor. I am happiest when I can dive. And this is the wreck of a guana boat that sunk over a hundred years ago. It's beautifully overgrown with anemones and sea urchins and giant barnacles and it's become an artificial reef. Since the end of the guano boom, these waters have been under relentless pressure from fishing. Every living thing is a candidate for the pot. And these days, almost all of it is undersized. The bounty of the sea never fails to amaze me. But it's clear that here, it has been strained to the limit. It's a staggering amount of empty shells. 
But unfortunately, for most fishermen, it's no big deal that these shells are smaller than the allowed size. Overfishing has now reached such levels that the population of marine mammals, like sea lions, are being seriously affected. I love to dive with these graceful animals. The only important thing though, is not to provoke the males, because they are very territorial, and especially during the breeding season, they can even attack you and chase you away. Yeah, great. But I'm cold. Man evolves on Earth, and in order to develop, he has to be near the sea, because that's the source of all riches. This man, El Gato, is a local fisherman who has some unique ideas to tackle the problems here. He's worried about the future. Given the bad management of the resource, we're going through a very critical phase. There's a clear task to be completed, something that we have to make other fishermen understand. If they don't organize themselves and handle the resource, there'll be no future. Everything looks so peaceful here on the beach of Paracas Bay, but in fact every day millions of liters of untreated wastewater and pool water are released into the sea. And of course this causes terrible problems for the wildlife. And we are right now here in Paracas. You see there on the other side, the problem is that from Pisco, from San Andres, from the fishing industry and even from these rich houses here, yeah. from these weekend houses, all the wastewater goes into the ocean without any treatment, but it's already very strong damaged by human activities. There's an illegal fishing village. Yeah. How is that, that possible inside the park? Well, it's like people settle there and then they are there and you have the problem, so you have to deal somehow with that problem. But it's already very damaged here and it yeah. has to be recuperated. Right. They're heading south on the Paracas Peninsula. Stefan is keen to show Dos the place where he's done most of his underwater research into the biodiversity of the area. This lives up to everything Stefan had said. This is the place where you've been diving a lot? Right, we have done the research here on biodiversity. We have made a three-dimensional mapping. We have localized the habitats. Yeah. We found in this bay, which is only covering 0.003% of the whole uh, marine surface of the areas, we found 30 species, which might be also new species to science. So this shows that this light, tiny little bay is a hotspot of biodiversity, Absolutely. which definitely should be protected in future in a better way. Dos joins Stefan in this marine wonder world on a survey dive to check current conditions. I am happy to find these colorful shrimp. Usually it's difficult to approach shrimp during the day, but these animals let me get right up to them. Now I'm beginning to understand Stefan's and Algato's concerns for this pristine area. Today we join Algato on a fishing trip. This man intrigues me. I wonder if this friendly fisherman will really be able to make the change among his fellow fishermen. I hope to find out more about him. On a spot with giant kelp, this diver will collect shells for consumption. Although the sea is calm, El Gato warns the team that there may be a heavy current near the bottom, and that the deeper they go, the worse the visibility will be. El Gato's diver will dive the old-fashioned way. 
He'll breathe air through a hose pipe that's connected to a compressor that's over 50 years old. Gata was right. Ten meters down, the current is vicious. For DOS, it makes taking pictures impossible. For the shell collector, it's all in the day's work. dangerous conditions you can imagine. There is a surge and a current and it smashes you from one side to the other on the rocks full of sea urchins and sharp barnacles and he's collecting his shells there. Incredible. The diver continues his battle with the swirling current for over an hour, picking off every shell he can find within a 10 meter radius of the boat. El Gato is horribly aware of how devastating this practice is in the long term. For the future, it is our dream to develop a small enterprise in order to supply jobs for our own family. Gato tells us about his ideas to change the way of clam collecting by farming clams. He already started a clam farm where he grows these shells in big bags that are fixed to ropes. It's still early days. While the initial results look encouraging, he will have to improve his technique significantly if his clam farm is to provide him and his family with a real income. However, by taking the initiative to look for a sustainable alternative, El Gato is offering his community an option for the future. My time in Paracas has really got me thinking. What's happening here is something that's repeating itself in countless coastal communities around the world. We have to rethink our relationship to the sea and the creatures that live in it. Another way to create income is through ecotourism. Although the guide's acts could use a little refining. Anchovies, yeah, after the one minute, guano. Anchovies, guano, guano, guano. The problems facing the Paracas community are stacking up. While fish farming offers one practical alternative, proper enforcement of the marine reserve will probably have the most wide-ranging effect. Less than one half of one percent of the world's oceans receive any kind of protection. But where it does exist, it has proven to have major economic benefits. Just five years after setting up marine reserves around the Caribbean island of Santa Lucia, fish catches have nearly doubled, showing that if properly managed, the ocean's bounty can return. <laughs>